I thought this morning, I may need to test this thing one time, and I thought, nah, this thing never lets me down. I um, was at a dirt bike race yesterday and was um, thinking about um, well, thinking about a lot of things, but thinking about what to preach on, and it's, it's amazing how God just kind of takes little pieces and puts things together and, and, and comes together as a sermon on Sunday morning. But um, I know everyone in this room, uh, just like myself, not happy with the current situation in our country. Um, I absolutely don't support the Democratic Party whatsoever at all because they're ungodly. You cannot say I'm a Christian and vote, support to abort babies and things that are abominations of God. You're lying to yourself. They're lying to themselves. And I saw where President Biden supposedly went, and maybe he did, to his church, a Catholic church, and prayed uh, the day before. Or the day of, well, I don't know what he was praying. And I don't know if they've redefined, uh, if he's redefined what Catholic beliefs are. But Catholics don't support abortion. Catholics don't support things that are an abomination to God. But I was thinking about things being redefined to make yourself feel good. You know, there's a, the, what, the assistant secretary of health who's an overweight man that wears a dress. That's the picture of health, isn't it? And then he's calling for unity. I can't be united with that. I can't be united with ungodly things. I cannot do it. What he's saying is, come on over here and join us. Go, come be conformed to the patterns of the world. When the, the Word of God says, don't be conformed to the patterns of the world. But to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the renewing of your mind by the Word of God. And what he's saying is, let's be united. You can't be united in a country that serves multiple gods. This is one nation under one God. And just because Obama stood up and said, this is no longer a Christian nation, but this is a nation of many faiths, I don't care what he says. Because he's not God. He didn't write the word. This country was founded by Christians, started by Christians. There was a Christian pastor that was here that was preaching to Native Americans. And somewhere along the way, between here, between there and here, things have been redefined, so to speak. Redefined. Christianity's been redefined. And I was thinking in the woods yesterday about how many people were there and they watched the pros on television. And they had the same helmet as their favorite rider and the same gear and same boots, same bike, same everything. But when they take off, they look like anything but that guy. But they look like it. They're dressed like it. They have the look. But their actions as they're riding, well, they haven't watched him ride or like your favorite athlete evidently you haven't been paying close attention i know you're wearing his jersey but you sure don't run the ball like he does and it's a difference between being a fan and being a follower see christianity's been redefined i haven't redefined it you guys haven't redefined it or some may have maybe i have in the past i'm preaching to myself this morning if you want to get right down to it and if y'all want to listen, you're, you're invited. But there's a big difference in being a Christian and being a follower. A follower. Being a follower of Jesus Christ. See, holding this microphone makes you start feeling like an evangelist. And I have to start preaming and screaming, and I may jump down and run around in a moment. We here? I might need my hands in a moment, both of them. <laughs> now think about 
like I said, think about redefining what a, what a Catholic represents. And uh, think about, have we defined and redefined what Christianity is until we feel good on the inside and we, have, we feel all warm and fuzzy about it? You know, you look at the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they brought the law down to a different standard till they felt good about it. In Acts, the 11th chapter, it says, When we had found him, he brought him, when, when he had found him, he brought him into Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now I want you to see there, Christians. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. That wasn't a word that was used prior to that. Jesus didn't say, hey, come on, be a Christian. But the Christians, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch by the Antioch people. And it wasn't the twelve apostles. It's, it's, a, it's talking to a broader group of people. The, uh, the disciples were followers of Jesus Christ. That was, that's what a disciple was, a follower. A disciple wasn't a Christian. A disciple, a disciple was a follower of Christ. A follower of Christ. So the people of Antioch you know, looked at them as they're different. They do things different. And they called them a Nazarene sect. And the citizens of Antioch gave them the name Christians. They're Christ Ians, like Americans. They're little Christ. They're trying to be like Christ. They're Christians. So they gave them the name Christians. They couldn't just call them disciples because there was a lot of disciples. There was priests that had disciples. There was wicked people that had disciples. So they couldn't just call them disciples. So they called the followers, the disciples of Jesus Christ, Christians. That's what they called them. Now think about a follower. What is a follower? Are you a follower? Am I a follower? Are we just, are we just content with being a Christian? And a follower is, are we following his example? Or are we just being the best example that we can be? Because uh, you can get satisfied with saying, well, I'm just being the best example I can be. But are you being the example that he left for you? That he set for you? That he gave us and said to follow? Believer or follower? Are you a believer or a follower? I'm a believer. We say that a lot. We're believers. Are you a believer? I'm a believer. I first believe. I believe. And it's good that you believe, but don't, don't be confused between believer and follower. Satan believes in Jesus. He's not a follower. Are you a believer or a follower? Are you a believer or a follower? In Isaiah... 55, 8 and 9, he says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. In fact, my thoughts and my ways are so much higher than yours that they're as far away as heaven is from earth. In other words, we're not even on the same page. We're not even on the same planet. My thoughts and my ways are way different than yours. And then Jesus comes on the scene and He teaches us what His ways are and what His thoughts are. He gives them to us. We get to see His thoughts. We get to see His ways in the flesh walking around as a man. That's God's ways and God's thoughts are Jesus. Do you see that? He didn't just leave it a mystery. He gave us Jesus to be an example. So we would actually have someone to follow. Amen? Amen. And following doesn't need defining. We can define what a Christian is, but following Jesus needed no defining. Following Jesus meant to live differently, to go in a different direction, to go in a different way. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Don't go in amongst them and be the same. And like I said, our government is saying, come on in amongst us and be the same. Unite with us. YouTube may kick us off. Facebook may too. I don't. Whoopty doopty. 
Because I'm going to be a follower. I don't care about likes and tweets and shares. It's just the Word of God, the truth of God's Word. I can't unite myself together as unequally yoked. So it kind of makes you angry. It kind of makes you want to get a hold of somebody. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? We just walk around mad all the time? It can get you mad. I have this mirror in my office. I forgot it was there. Hmm. Mm, wow. It's, this is a little wooden mirror with a handle on it. And uh, I'm trying. Mm, it belonged to my mother in law. And I grabbed it up this morning and I looked in it, I looked at myself and I thought, who is this in this mirror? Is this just a guy that's content with being a Christian or is this a follower? And if, I, if I'm going to be mad, I really don't have any reason to be mad at anybody but that guy in the mirror. And uh, just when you look in the mirror, I guess the question is, what, what, what do you see looking back at you? Do you see a follower of Christ in the mirror? If we hired a private investigator to follow you around or follow me around for about a month and take pictures and videos and all the ins and outs of the days of your life, at the, at the end of the time, could he collect enough evidence to convict you or I of being a follower of Christ? Because it's not sitting in a chair amen and nodding. It's a lot bigger than that. His ways or his thoughts are as far away as heaven is from earth. So Jesus preaches the Sermon on the Mount. And he tells us what his ways are. And he tells us what his thoughts are. You're talking about the Sermon on the Mount. These people are going to hear a sermon. They don't know what they're going to hear. The most famous, most popular sermon in the entire in history of the world. The Sermon on the Mount is full, packed, full of scriptures that we use and quote all the time. And you may not realize where they came from, but they come from the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, this is an event that these people are at. I think about how awesome it would be to be there, and I've been to some cool events. I remember about 25 years ago, I was at an event with a, some people were gathered around, and um, everybody was drinking and partying and having a good time, and I was stone cold sober. But Alab that, that has a point to it in just a moment. Alabama was playing Auburn, and Auburn was ahead. I'm not sure the exact score, but they were ahead by a point or two. And it got down just to the last... A few minutes there of the ball game, and Alabama scored. Uh, perhaps they scored a touchdown or a field goal. Hard to believe they kicked a field goal, but they may have. I'm not sure, but I know they won. And I'm talking about everybody went crazy and was jumping and screaming and shouting and going bonkers. I was there. That was a spectacular event. So I was sober. But this one guy was really drunk, and he'd been getting on my nerves. And he had a broken foot and his foot was in a boot well he was giving everybody high fives I'll never forget this he was giving everybody high fives and he was coming towards me and I thought I'm fixing to give this dude a high five he will never forget 
I'm going to knock the skin off his hand. And so uh, he stumbled as he was bringing, <laughs> as he was bringing this high five, he stumbled. And then all of a sudden, now his face is where his hands should be. And I high five dude right across the side of the head, knocked him to the ground, and I didn't feel bad about it, not a bit. <laughs> That's why I hadn't forgot that event. He was a great, he was a good one. Grow tide. But this was a lot bigger than that. The Sermon on the Mount's way bigger than the Braves making it to the World Series or any other event you've ever seen in your entire life. This is a big deal. And all these people are gathered around at the Sermon on the Mount. And I can't read the whole thing. It's in the Gospels, but I'm going to read it out of Matthew today. Chapters 5, 6, and 7. You ought to read the whole thing to its entirety. Three chapters jam-packed. Every word solid red. It's awesome. And these people are here to witness that. Not knowing they're going to be... a I mean, the most famous sermon in history. You can go online and Google uh, some different things. They did, a, they did like a poll, and they asked Christians, uh, who preached the Sermon on the Mount? And it says 75% of Christians said Billy Graham. And he preached some awesome sermons. He got millions of people saved. But that just goes to show there's a lot of people sitting in chairs nodding and saying amen, but don't really know the Word of God. Jesus Christ preached a Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to read some of it to you. Chapter 5, starting in the first verse. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall in inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are hungry and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. And he goes on. Like I said, it's three chapters. He says, you're the salt of the earth, and what good is the salt if it loses its saltiness? And you're a light. And the light should be set on top of the hill. Why? So everybody can see. You're a lamp. You're a lamp to the feet of men. You shouldn't hide a lamp under a basket. Then he talks about adultery. He says, hey, adultery isn't what you think it is anymore. I've raised the standard. Now if you even look at a woman and lust in your heart, you committed adultery in your heart. If you look at her and lust, you committed it in your heart. Murder? If you hate your brother without cause, you're in danger of judgment. He says if your right eye is causing you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand is causing you to sin, cut it off. If you're at the altar and you've brought your gift to the altar to present it to God, and you're there and you remember, uh-oh, I've got a little problem back at home with my brother or my sister or, or some friend. It says to leave your gift at the altar. Go find your brother and sister and be reconciled to them before you come back and bring your gift to the altar. In other words, you got unforgiveness? Go settle it. Go settle it. Go settle it quickly. Somebody comes up and says, give me your tunic. Give me your cloak too. If somebody compels you to go one mile, go two miles. And you've heard eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but what I say is somebody comes up and slaps your face, turn the other cheek. Somebody wants to borrow something from you, just give it to them. He says there's two gates. There's a narrow gate and a broad gate, and the narrow gate leads to life, and the broad gate leads to destruction. There's not many people going through the narrow gate, but the broad gate, boy, it is a crowded highway. These people are astonished. 
I'm going to pick up in the 43rd verse. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Say what? His ways really are higher. His thoughts really are higher. That you may be the sons of your Father in heaven, for He makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. These people hear this sermon. He preached it's 5, 6, and 7. At the very end of chapter 7, the, the Scripture actually says the people were astonished. They were amazed at how he preached with such authority. Not like the others taught, but he taught like a man with authority. And it says that they were astonished. And um, shortly thereafter, the, the sermon, when he comes down the mountain, is where we're going to pick up. When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. He's got a following. Great multitudes following him. Following him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. He had just got finished saying, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. He just got finished going, chapters 5, 6, and 7, preaching the greatest sermon ever. Now he's come down the mountain. Now there's an opportunity to walk out what you've been talking. And this man covered with leprosy, who you're not supposed to touch... They're supposed to be away, separate in a leper, leprous colony because they're, it was an awful, terrible disease. And if you touched anybody with leprosy, you got leprosy. You were unclean. And the man says, that he came to worship, saying, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately, this leprosy left. I want you to see here that the man with leprosy didn't give leprosy to Jesus. Jesus didn't get leprosy, but rather the leper got what Jesus had, which was healing. And I'm not preaching on healing today. I just want you to see, as soon as he preached his sermon and came down the mountain, immediately he had an opportunity right there to stop and say, who's this guy always asking me for money? You just preach a sermon about being a cheerful giver and doing to others as you won't do it unto yourself and to be kind, but then now somebody needs some money or needs some help and you're going, well, I'm a believer and I'm a Christian, but I'm not a follower. Mm. But you don't know that made me mad. They made me mad. That's why I'm not going to help them. That's not why I'm going to, I'm going to help that leper out. Jesus is walking the talk. He's living out these values, these thoughts and these ways that Isaiah tells us about. That's his thoughts. That's his ways. Now he's walking what he's talking. And down in the fifth verse, this is the big one. This is the big one. I've preached on this many times. You've heard it preached from me and other people many times. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. A centurion. It's a Roman centurion. Came to Jesus asking for help. He said, Lord, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. You know, there's some churches out there that have homosexual pastors. They use this scripture and they say that the Roman centurion was obviously gay because he was concerned about this paralyzed man back at home and Jesus loved him and Jesus healed him. That's why it's okay to be gay. Now you're talking about taking some scripture out of the Bible and twisting it and, and perverting it. But anyway, this Roman centurion comes and he says, Jesus, I need some help. I need some help. You're talking about the big one. 
This is the big one. See, we always preach about this because the centurion asked for help, and Jesus says, okay, I'll help you. I'll come to your house. He says, I'm not even worthy. I'm unfit. You can't even come under my roof because I'm so unworthy, but I'm a man under authority like you, and I say one, go here and go there, come here and come here, and they do it. I understand authority, so if you'll just say the word, my servant will be healed. And he says, I've never, I haven't found such great faith in all of Israel. And he says, go and your servant will be healed. We, we use that talking about healing, about healing. But... I want to hit it from a different angle today. You have to understand what that man represented. Jesus is just up there preaching the Sermon on the Mount. Then he comes down and he is confronted by a Roman centurion. A Roman centurion asking for help. Do you know who crucified Jesus? The Romans. They weren't friends. The Jews and the Romans weren't. The Romans haven't done anything at all for the Jewish people to help them at all. Only things to hurt them. These people are all gathered around watching to see what Jesus is fixing to do. If he does, if he walks out the talk, he may lose all his followers. He may not get any more likes on Facebook. I mean, hashtag, you know, love thy neighbor, uh, hashtag do unto others, hashtag go the extra mile, uh, heal some sick Jewish people. That's one thing. But now this Roman centurion who these people absolutely hate, all these people that are following Christ, they don't like the Roman centurion or anything he represents. They don't like him. Because you have to go back. Let me give you a little history. You go back about a hundred years ago, uh, there was a Roman, Roman inter, emperor called Pompey. And he went on a tour of Israel and he says, I want to see this God. Show me this God. So he goes to the temple and he says, I don't see a God here. Where's the God? I don't see him. You mean you built this big magnificent structure and y'all bring sacrifices in here and worship a God? There's, I can't, there's no physical God here. I don't even see him. So he takes the money and he leaves. He takes the money from the temple. He also takes thousands of Jews enslaved back with him. And then essentially, at that, at that point in time, uh, Judea and Galilee were annexed in, uh, under the Roman Empire and had to pay Roman taxes. They lost their independence. After that Roman general uh, crashes, he comes in, he takes the temple money. In other words, you have to think about people, you guys, come here, tithes and offerings to the church. Then, some wicked emperor comes in here and just takes it all the way and leaves with it. Would you feel good about it? And when somebody that represented him came up and said, I need some help, would we want to help him? Yeah, we'll help bury you. <laughs> but his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And if we're going to be a follower, we're going to have to start thinking and acting like Jesus. In about 40 B.C., Herod the Great comes on the scene and he murders Jews and his son actually beheads John the Baptist. You have to understand how much hurt are on these people that Jesus has just preached to. How much hurt that Roman centurion represents to all these people. Pontius Pilate comes on the scene. After that, he introduces crucifixion to the Judeans and the Galileans. He also stole money from the temple. He was so cruel and violent, they recalled him to Rome because of his violence towards the people. And the Roman centurion, you know how he earned that rank? Violence. He does what they tell him to do. And they were so strict that they would flog and even execute their own soldiers if they got out of line. That's what that Roman centurion represented. He represented everything that Jesus had the right to hate. He had blood on his hands. So who's the centurion in your life? Who's the centurion in my life? It's so easy to help a stranger, isn't it? It is. A stranger in need of help. You've never met him. I don't know him. I don't know her. Yeah, I'll help you. And you leave and you feel good about it. It makes you feel good. You may not know that you just helped a guy that escaped prison for murder. You just might have 
helped a child molester. You might have just helped the most evil, wicked person that's ever walked in this community, but you don't know it. You helped them, and it felt good. It does. It feels good to help, doesn't it? It feels good to help. When you don't know them, it feels good. But to help someone who's hurt me, that don't feel good. Oh, I've got to help someone who's not only hurt me, but hurt someone I love? So Jesus is fixing to help this Roman centurion who's not only hurt him, but hurt everybody around him? Hurt his whole family? Hurt his whole race? Been impacting them for a hundred years? The same ones that are eventually going to crucify him? Herod? who wanted to kill him when he was a baby. Jesus' mama had to give birth in a barn with a bunch of animals on some hay. And I'm going to help you. The worst thing that's ever happened to me is way better than that. Luke 6 and 33 says, And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do that. Even sinners do that. People that don't even know Jesus, full-blown, 100% atheist, they even do that. They'll do good to somebody that does good, do good for me, do good for you. One time I hired this uh, Hispanic guy, and he couldn't speak English, and I was trying to explain to him some stuff, and he didn't understand. And I said, come here. And I scratched his back, and I turned around. I did like that. And I said, you comprehend? And he said, see, I scratch your back, you scratch my back. And we got the job done. It's easy to scratch somebody's back when they're scratching your back. Actually, sometimes I'll, I'll be scratching Jackie's back for she likes me to scratch her head. But as soon as she starts scratching me, I'm like, oh, I stop. I'm just like paralyzed and forget. <laughs> forget, forget you. you Missed a spot right here. But you know what I mean. Somebody does good for you, you're going to turn the favor. Our friends. I mean, I got a lot of friends in here. Friends of people, you know, in here for, oh man, years. Date back to high school. Friends. I don't mind helping them. Why? Look, look, look what they've done for me. They've helped me. I call anytime. Broke down the side of the road. Boom. They're on the way. I don't have any money to buy groceries. Boom. On the way. Whatever. And they call me. I do the same. Call me and say, hey, uh, my son's at home, scared, hiding under the bed because he thinks somebody's breaking in. Boom, on the way. But what if somebody calls you that you don't like? You know, y'all follow me? See, this is common. What Jesus is saying is that's common to do good to those who do good to you. That's common. But my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. So the people are watching. What's he going to do? You're talking about, you know how you watch those movies and somebody says something and it freezes and it goes, and it backs up and they say it again? That's what happened. It froze. And everybody's listening intently. What is he going to do? Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a sentry came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed and dreadfully tormented. Dreadfully tormented like we've been? You've been? You make a living out of dreadfully tormenting people. And now I'm supposed to feel sorry for you, and I'm going to come to your house and do because somebody's being tormented at your house? Oh, bless you. How's Jesus going to respond? And Jesus said to him, I'll come and I'll heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. But just speak a word, my servant will be healed. He says, I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go. And he goes, another come. And he comes to my servant, do this. And he does it. And Jesus heard it. He marveled and said to those who followed, Surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I know I just quoted that a minute ago, but I want you to see it on the screen. He commends his faith. He could have responded with thanks to your people. No, I ain't coming to your house. Thanks to your people. We've been through this and we've been through that. Jesus had the, 
could have lost his crowd, if people had lost his followers because Jesus helped this centurion who's been the Romans, represent everything that we don't like. Now notice it says Jesus commends his faith. He commends his faith as if his past doesn't matter. Hmm. Jesus' words and his deeds line up. He talked it. He preached it. He went out and he walked it and he lived it. You mean he literally expects us to do good for those who don't even like us? People that aren't for us and we're supposed to do good for them? We're supposed to pray for them? Hmm. This is where this is where it comes down to follower or Christian. Follower or Christian? Christian or a follower? Because Christian is easy. Come into church. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done. I appreciate it. So I don't have to go to heaven. Thank you so much. Let me give you a high five, and I'll go on about my life. Christian is easy. It's easy to get to heaven. But follower, that's going to cost you something. See, these people down here in Fortinville, they've just experienced a bad, bad, bad experience. Lost their homes. One fellow lost his leg. One mama lost her son. Lost her homes. It's easy to help them. We're, we're taking a collection up, and we're going to deliver it. And I've got some stuff in, in my truck, and some stuff here, and other people I have already been doing. It's easy to help them. You want to help them. You want to help them. You want to go out and help people like that. And think about, is that it? Just content with being a Christian? See, if we're not followers, it'll just end with that. You'll just be content with helping people that a storm hit their house every 10 years. Or you'll be content with helping somebody buy a couple of bucks of gas occasionally. You'll just be content with sitting in church and amening and giving a few nods. And but not following. So after Jesus unpacks this sermon, that's what he's saying. He tells them at the very end of chapter 7, at the very end of all these things he says, he tells them what his thoughts are. He tells them what his ways are. Okay? At the very end of chapter 7, he says, But everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So in other words, you heard it. You're content with being a Christian. You agreed with it. You said it sounds good. You heard it. But you don't do them. And if you don't, you're like a foolish man. You're kidding yourself. You're fooling yourself. You think your house is all real nice and pretty. But when the storm comes, your house may look just like the house next to it. But when the storm comes, your house is not going to be standing. The wind and the water is going to beat against the house and it's not going to be standing because it wasn't built on the sand. But the house that's built on the rock, it'll still be there. Couldn't tell the difference before the storm. They both look pretty. That's why he ends with this. He says, you've heard my sayings. Now it's time to do them. Amen. Mark said last week about bringing it. Bringing it. See, when you're a follower, you're bringing it. That's what it is. You're bringing it. I'm bringing it. You know, somebody comes up to you and starts some trouble with you, and you're like, bring it. Don't run your mouth. Nothing between me and you and everybody. Bring it. You go on the football field, you're going to bring it. Basketball, bring it. Baseball, bring it. Dirt bike race, bring it. I like it when people go to work and bring it. Just bring it. You need to come to church and bring it. Just bringing it. See, we can understand right there on a natural level, but I'm talking about bringing something else. See, when you're a follower of Christ, boy, that gives a whole new definition and meaning to bring it. 
When you're going to do something good for someone who has misused you and abused you, like that Roman centurion, Jesus brought it. That's what bringing it is. That's how we're supposed to bring it. Don't just nod and agree and go, okay, yes, yeah, sure, but whatever, ever leaving, going out here, going down the road, still hating that same person you've been hating. I'm telling you, you need, I got that mirror in my office. Y'all all look in the bar and look in it and see who's looking back at you. I want to challenge you. I feel like this is challenging me. I know I don't feel like it is. I know it is. It's challenging me. I want to challenge you this morning to make a difference, to be a follower, to bring it, to act and react like Jesus, even when it costs you. Because being a Christian doesn't cost you. We don't cost you a thing. It's free. Salvation's free. He went, he died on the cross for you. You didn't feel any pain, any suffering. It's free. But being a follower, it will cost you. It'll cost you some friends. It'll cost you what appears to be a good time. It'll cost you some likes, some shares, some, some, some Facebook friends. It may even cost you a marriage. I know a preacher one time and his wife said, you either choose me or God. He chose God, she left him. I don't want you to be content with being a Christian. I don't want to be content with being a Christian. And every one of us is going to be confronted by the centurion. Hey, uh, I need some help. My servant's paralyzed. I need some help. You need help? You need a loan? I'm going to pay you back this time. You had not paid me back the last time. Will you give me a second chance? I've already gave you seven second chances. Can I come over for Christmas? Do you remember what you did last Christmas? Just trust me. Trust you? You've been doing nothing but lying for the past 10 years. I guess we could go on a list a mile long, whoever the centurion is in your life. But whoever it is, when you're confronted by the centurion, I've got a scripture for you and for me and for all of us. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What that means is while you were still a Roman centurion, Christ died for you. In fact, in fact, Christ died for the very ones who put him on the cross. He died for the very ones who whipped him, who put the crown of thorns on his head, plucked his beard out, spit in his face, wrongfully accused him, beat the skin off of his body, nailed the nails to his hands and feet, put him up on the cross, rammed a spear through his side. He died for them. That's a good one to apply to whoever your centurion in your life is. Amen. And I'm going to end with this scripture right here. I want you to know this. Not one time in the Bible did Jesus say, I want to invite everyone to come out and be a Christian. Never. He never invited anybody to be a Christian. He, he never even said, I encourage you to be a Christian. Never. But you know what he did 13 separate times? He gave invitations to follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Peter, follow me. Matthew, follow me. Philip, follow me. Hey, follow me. Follow me. He come off from preaching the Sermon on the Mount. And when they saw him interact with a centurion, and he said, follow me. He probably lost a lot of followers. They probably said, we can't do that. And thousands, 2,000 years later, here we are. And churches all over the country are satisfied with being Christians because they really can't 
see themselves being followers of Christ because that's just not natural. And what Jesus is talking about is not natural. It's supernatural. He said this to his disciples. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Are you a Christian or are you a disciple? Because Jesus laid down his life, picked up the cross, and carried it. And he said, if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to have to do the same thing. You're going to have to lay down your life, pick up the cross, and follow me. Jesus is carrying his cross. He laid down his life. He's carrying his cross. And he said he's inviting you. You want to be a follower? Lay down your life. Pick up your cross. Deny yourself. You follow me. He says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. When you deny yourself, it's not about me. I'm losing my life. I'm picking up my cross, and I'm following Jesus. Then, and only then, that's when you'll find life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Christian or follower, or we could say bring it, part two. Are you really bringing it? Because it's hitting a fist fight. Even though I think that I could probably go in the White House and square off with somebody in there and probably put them in a coma permanently, that's not the fight I'm talking about. Did I say that? I don't want to do that. I got to pray for my enemies. I'm just joking. I'm kidding. What I'm saying is it's not, it's not a fleshly fight. This is a spiritual thing, a spiritual thing. And to do, who's, who's the centurion? I, I'm, I'm going to stop. Who's the centurion in, in your life? And are you at the altar and you need to, to leave the altar and, and go run back and make things right with somebody? That's what Jesus tells us to do. Amen. Spirit's moving up there. Y'all get anything out of this today? Amen. David, what's this got to do with, with David? We've been preaching about David for weeks. David wasn't content with just being the king. He didn't say, I made it. I'm here. Saul's dead. I'm in charge. I can do anything I want. No, he, he said, we've got to go get the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of God, and we've got to bring it back. Mm. You see the correlation there? Well, praise the Lord. So I look in that mirror this morning, I think about, I can't really blame anybody in, in our government. Can't do it. Can't blame them. I don't agree with them. I don't even like them. I don't agree, I don't agree with them. I can't blame them. Because how did it get like that? Christians quit following Christians quit following and I can't make you follow and you can't make me follow and I can't make anybody follow and nobody can make me follow but I can follow I can choose to serve the Lord as for me in my house we're going to serve the Lord I'm in charge of me and my house and everybody in here has got your own me and your own house and that's where you're going to start amen Praise the Lord. See what, what, what that man didn't realize or what we don't realize is when Jesus says, go make things right, you're, you're here at the altar. Your house is actually here at the altar. Go make things right and come back. In other words, you got to get things right in your house. 
your house is built on the sand or is your house built on the rock? I'm in charge of nobody's house but my own. Amen. We got to bring it, church. We got to bring it. How do you bring it? Follow Jesus. Those WWJD bracelets, they shouldn't just be cool because they match your shirt. They should really be, what will Jesus do? When somebody comes up to you and does you wrong, what would Jesus do? And as a follower of Jesus Christ, there's only one thing for me to do. Whatever Jesus would do. That's a lot easier said than done, isn't it? Praise the Lord. Well, let's pray. Jesus never invited us to be a Christian, but he invited every one of us to be a follower. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be a follower of Christ. We thank you for sending your son to die on a cross for us so that our sins can be forgiven. We thank you for sending your son to show us the way and to lead us and guide us so that we have an example to follow. He's the author and the finisher, the perfecter of our faith, and we're going to keep our eye on the mark. We're not going to be distracted by the cares of this world, by the storms of life, and we're going to keep our eyes on Jesus. I'm following him. I got no time to veer left and right. I'm following Jesus. I'm following Jesus. Father, thank you for giving us the supernatural strength to face our centurions and to follow Jesus at all cost. We thank you for the, the life, the breath of life that you've breathed into each and every one of us as believers, born-again believers. And we're leaving out and going home today better than we came in. It's all because of the Word of God. It's in the name of Jesus we gather, and it's in the name of Jesus we pray and agree. Amen and amen. Well, y'all enjoy the rest of your day. Don't forget about we're taking up donations for the tornado victims. Don't forget Monday night women's Bible study here at 6.30. Men's Bible study here at 6.30 on Wednesdays. Enjoy your rest of your week.